Uh, hey, uh, this is David Kovacs. I did my presentation on the second coming by W.B. Yeats. Uh, this is my poetry presentation. So I'm going to read the poem first off. Uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out, out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So uh, this poem has, in my opinion, a lot of misconceptions. Um, one of them is that this poem is a classic retelling of the second coming of Christ. Um, the second coming in this does not actually refer to the second coming of Christ or refers to something else, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then uh, the beast is the classic antichrist from Christian mythology, uh, like a singular entity that will place himself as a false Christ and people follow him and such. Uh, so just a brief background on the poem. Um, it was written in 1919, right after World War I, um, and it was during a period of great upheaval, uh, including the Treaty of Versailles, the Spanish flu and the Irish rebellion, all things which affected W.B. Yeats when he wrote this. Um, that's just kind of a background to put some stuff into context. So uh, W.B. Yeats, uh, he puts a lot of his own uh, cosmology and things the way the, of the way the world works into his poems. Um, and as such, I'm going to explain some of those because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's hard to know what's going on. So uh, the first thing is uh, he had this idea that civilization uh, kind of goes in these gyres, this, uh, this kind of this cone here that moves up and down and that uh, each of these gyres, it represents about 2000 years with civilization going like this. And then when it gets to the end of this, uh, the age, uh, it's the end of the age and then civilization starts moving in the upper direction starting here where it ended way out here. Um, and according to Yeats, he thought that uh, the world history went through, has, has gone through this cycle time and time again. Um, so when we look at this uh, for the first three sentences of the poem, we have turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. So. Uh, this turning and turning in the widening gyre, obviously a falcon is going to move in, you know, this kind of this gyre shape as it is. But he's also referring to his view of this is the way that civilization works. So civilization is moving through this gyre and it's getting wider and wider and closer to the end of its age and it's starting a new one. Um, so, uh, so when we get to the falcon cannot hear the falconer and the center cannot hold, um, these first three sentences really contain a lot of circular uh, motions and circular themes in it. Um, and it's uh, describing civilization here, these two sentences here that the falcon cannot hear the falconer and things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And uh, Basically, uh, you know, as it's going through these widening uh, gyres, the civilization is spinning and uh, and civilization is going outward. Uh, so, like, you can think of it like if there's a fire dancer here and she's got, you know, uh, two, both ends of her sticker on the flame and she's swinging it over her head. Civilization is like the flame, the civilization is like this and mankind is going outward. And then the center is this arm here that's trying to keep civilization together. Uh, it's also, you know, uh, the falconer is obviously the center who's trying to talk and he can't be, the falcon cannot hear him. Civilization cannot hear this center part that's trying to keep it together. 
Um, and uh, the center is obviously uh, some people trying to keep civilization together and most notably Christ and Christian values are, uh, is the center of the civilization. Um, so the next couple of sentences uh, of the poem uh, are basically just a description of what's going on. Um, they're almost told it kind of, you know, uh, this is going on. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loose, and everywhere the cer ceremony of innocence is ground. It's told in almost like, a, you know, this is a list of things that are going on. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, one thing to mention here is that you can see that the scansion uh, is very, it, it brings to mind almost this tired resignation, this, you know, uh, like I said, I mean, the, this is just what is going on. This is a list of what's going on. Um, once again, you can see here, the worst, uh, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. This is another uh, callback to the center not being able to hold. The people in the middle don't have the, you know, the passionate intensity to keep civilization together. Um, so this poem is full of some is full of a lot of religious symbolism. Uh, you know, we have the second coming, obviously, and the beast, which is half human, half animal. That's a classic, uh, something from Revelations. We have Bethlehem, and of course, just the word revelation are all uh, straight out of the Bible. Um, this brings to mind the story of the second coming of Christ. I think the poem is doing this so that it can uh, directly oppose it or tell a different version of it. We're going to get into that a little bit later. It, it's telling the story of what the true second coming is. And so it's bringing to mind with all this symbolism, the second coming, and then it's going to uh, go against that. It's going to subvert your expectations of that. So uh, the most notable creature or the most notable thing in the poem, I should say, is the beast. It's the center part of the entire poem. Uh, so uh, before we get into exactly what the beast is, we need to uh, clarify this word here, spiritus mundi. Um, so this is another one of Yeats's belief that he put into his poem. Um, and it means world spirit. And he believed that there's this thing, is this spiritus mundi that contains the collected memories of all time. Uh, it's very close to like the collective unconscious of Jung, where all of mankind has kind of this center, this uh, this kind of spirit that all of mankind has that it shares with each other. So uh, we get here, uh, when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight somewhere in the sands of the desert. So, um, there's a couple of ways you can look at this sentence. Um, the way that it kind of talked to me is that he's looking into a vision from Spiritus Mundi. So he's looking into the collective consciousness of mankind. And he's, as he looks into this collective unconsciousness of mankind, he sees this beast in the wasteland. Um, this creature with the shape of a, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a, ga a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun. Um, so, Basically, uh, this creature is man. It's it's mankind's worst uh, worst tendencies personified. Uh, so this is not this beast is not an active member of the age. It's not uh, it's not the antichrist in the normal sense. At least I don't think it is. Uh, at least in the normal Christian sense of you know, this person who will come back, who will bring evil. It's simply, it's something that's being caused by mankind, not affecting mankind. Uh, so here we get to the vision part of uh, his, of Yeats's poem. So uh, we have here, surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. Um, it, this is the narrator. He wants to see a vision. Um, He's looking at all these things going wrong in the world, and he's saying, well, this is obviously surely the second coming uh, of Christ. We're going to see Christ coming. Um, so hardly are these words out when a vast image of spiritus mundi, 
And then we have this description of the beast that I read in the last uh, slide of this monster. So he's pretty much asking, you know, he says, I want to see a vision of the second coming. Surely we're there. Surely we're going to see this of Christ coming in. And then instead he sees this description of this beast uh, of mankind. And then here it says, the darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. So we have, uh, he basically, he knows that the next world age or the dire will have the beast as the center instead of Christ, who Christ has been the center for the last uh, 2000 years. And now this beast, this worst of all mankind is going to be the center of the next 2000 years. Um, and that, uh, you know, uh, that we're, that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. Once again, you can put this back to the center cannot hold, uh, this rocking cradle, AKA Christ is the hand that's holding the flaming, uh, that's holding the flaming stick together of civilization per se. Um, the perhaps the most, uh, odd word in here is the word cradle. I actually do not understand why this word is in here. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's odd. It sh uh, you would think it would be manger instead of rocking cradle because manger is the classic thing that Christ is in. I don't know if he just thought that was too on the nose or what. I'm honestly just, I'm going to come clean and say, I don't understand why those two words are there. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so as the beast is replacing Christ in that way, it very much is the antichrist. Uh, though not in a classic mythological sense. Uh, and then, of course, we end with this last sentence, uh, and what rough beast, it's our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Um, this is one of the most famous lines in all of poetry, uh, but uh, obviously I think slouches here is the most uh, important word probably in the entire poem, it gives this feeling of just this, uh, your, mankind is falling in to its next, into this new world. It will tiredly fall into this new world. It's fallen apart. Um, and you know, you can use the word rough here as well. The entire poem is full of these words. Uh, you know, I mean, we have rough, uh, mere anarchy as opposed to just anarchy. Um, But yeah, I mean, real sh shadows, uh, very much uh, the idea that mankind is falling into this, that this is not some great evil that is controlling mankind. It's just that this is mankind falling apart and this is what it naturally becomes. Um, so this poem obviously is probably most famous for its powerful imagery. Uh, you know, just the falcon not being able to hear the falcony and this rough beast slouching towards Bethlehem to be the new center of the new age. Um, the theme, mankind's inherent tendency toward evil and chaos is the theme of the poem uh, and of the things that are holding it together and in this particular case are not. Um, the scansion in the words make the reader feel tired resignation, both on the part of the nature and mankind. Um, and this is, once again, just to sum up one last time, I do not think this is just a retelling of the classic story of the second coming of Christ. Uh, there is nothing in the poem about Christ coming again. The only reason why I think you think that, why people think that is because it uses the term second coming. And uh, that is my presentation. Uh, and here's my bibliography. And uh, thank you very much for